we might need to pump the brakes on erythritol for just a second. We might need to put down the erythritol sweetened drinks. We might need to put down the low carb treats for just a second while we unpack this study because the study that just came out is an interventional design, which means that we take it more serious than we do say observational studies. And just to give you context of what that means, in, in 2023, there was a study that came out about erythritol that scared a lot of people saying erythritol can cause heart disease and platelet aggregation and possible clotting. But the internet destroyed that study, myself included. I did a video on it last year. I had a lot of very, very esteemed experts talking about it as well. It was practically immoral in how it was designed. It basically made it look like erythritol was bad and all they did is like deal with it in a Petri dish, really, at the end of the day. Like it was just, it was a bad game of connect the dots. This study that just came out, however, 2024 in the summer, this one we do need to take more serious because it's actually from the same research group but what they did is they did an interventional design where they said, okay, we know we got destroyed last year. Let's actually really take it a step further and take people and make them an intervention group where we give them erythritol and then we monitor what happens somewhat in their body. So let's break down what they found and how you can kind of be safe and thread this needle a little bit. After today's video, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. They are not sweetened with erythritol. Element Electrolytes are 1000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium and 60 milligrams magnesium, but that link down below gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase of Element Electrolytes. So whether you purchase their sparkling, whether you purchase their stick packs or whatever, you get a free sample variety pack and that's exclusively using my link down below. That is drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Again, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Really interesting stuff. They curb my appetite entirely but I also have them in a fasted state and I sip on them during my fasted workouts because I feel like I actually get replenished, but I also get my cravings satisfied. So that link is down below in the description. So let's break down what this study did and we're gonna go deeper than the rest of the internet because if you look surface level of this study, it's gonna have you throw all your erythritol in the trash. And this study was designed and definitely is being articulated in such a way where even I wanted to do that at first. So make no mistake, it was well-crafted with how it was put out. And the studies, well, let's just get into it. They took 20 subjects, they had them fast overnight, and they drew their blood. They measured what their baseline blood levels looked like, mainly their platelets. And then they gave them 30 grams of erythritol or 30 grams of glucose, and then drew their blood again and measured their platelets. Okay, They treated their platelets with something called ADP, which is an agonist, as well as something that was called thrombin activator peptide 6. So they treated them in a petri dish there. Now let's talk about their findings and what they ultimately found. When they gave subjects erythritol, there was a 1,000 fold increase in their blood erythritol levels. That's not that surprising, but it's actually important and relevant because the glucose group didn't have any increase in erythritol. Now erythritol is produced in the human body. It is produced via a pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway, PPP. And this is particularly elevated in unhealthy people. Okay, so what they found is that glucose did not elevate any blood levels of erythritol at all, but erythritol certainly did. 1,000 fold increase in erythritol above baseline. So, okay, that's not alarming. Like it's no surprise that consuming erythritol would raise erythritol levels. But the point here was that glucose did not increase even through any wraparound way, erythritol levels. But what was interesting was that there was a quote unquote striking difference in platelet aggregation in the erythritol group. So when they looked at the actual Petri dish with the platelets, when they drew the blood, there was a significant amount of platelets that were clotting with the erythritol group and not with the glucose group. What does this really mean? It essentially means that more erythritol meant more aggregation. More erythritol meant more clotting. Okay, so do we need to ditch the sodas? Do we need to ditch those drinks? Well, we're gonna get to that in a second because we have to remember, they drew the blood after erythritol consumption and then they treated it in a weird chemical way. They added agonists. They basically tortured 
the platelets in a Petri dish and saw that they did something. I think you're starting to see, you're smart, you're starting to see, wait a minute, there's something the rest of the internet is missing here, and it's a critical flipping component. Okay, there was another thing they found though. Erythritol increased dense granular markers of serotonin and something called CXCL4, which is sort of a biomarker associated with that. We'll talk about what exactly what that means. Because when you have platelets aggregate, okay, what can happen is they can kind of bind to the endothelium, the lining of the arterial wall. When they bind to the lining of the arterial wall, they can form and cause more of a buildup and eventually could potentially lead to, lead to a uh, thrombosis, right? So a clot, which would cause a massive amount more of platelets to form. When platelets activate, they actually release these dense granular type serotonins and CXCL4. So, ser so they actually hold, like platelets hold serotonin in them. So when they activate, they release. So the fact that erythritol released these compounds means that platelets did not just aggregate in response to erythritol. Platelets full on activated, which is actually even more interesting. All right, pump the brakes now. Now we get fun. What the heck? If you give me an erythritol sweetened beverage and then you draw my blood and you put it in a Petri dish and then you take a syringe and you add chemicals, and then you take another syringe and you add more chemicals and agonists and you mix it up in that Petri dish. That is not what happens in the human body. Uh, not at all. So they didn't measure clotting in the human body. They measured clotting after they drew blood, tortured it in a Petri dish and said, hey, look, the erythritol group responded more to these agonists. That means practically nothing. It really means practically nothing. They're at it again. They're going even further to try to like, okay, we're gonna do an interventional study, but then we're gonna kind of manipulate this a little bit. They weren't measuring clotting action in the blood. They weren't measuring CXCL4 in the blood. They weren't measuring these dense granular type serotonins in the blood in the human. They were doing it in isolation with ridiculous extreme amounts of a chemical of an agonist and this thrombin activator peptide six. That's not what happens in the human body. What? So I'm all over Instagram and I'm seeing this and I'm seeing like reputable people posting about this and I'm like, no guys, like, so this, I'm not saying that this is a smear campaign on erythritol, but I'm kind of saying it's a little bit of a smear campaign on erythritol because this is the same group that published an erythritol study last year that got destroyed. Same group that published that xylitol study earlier this year that tried to take down xylitol, but again, people kind of found the same exact problems with the xylitol study as they did with the erythritol study. And they're always trying to compare it to glucose, saying sugar's not a problem. Glucose isn't a problem, but get rid of this erythritol. I don't understand why they would do this. I mean, we do know that high circulating levels of blood sugar are problematic and are certainly a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for clotting, for thrombosis. Do we need to try to take down erythritol? I guess we do if it's potentially a threat. And maybe erythritol is just the easiest target because there's a metabolic function of erythritol. For example, when I had Dr. Ben Bickman on my channel, we talked about aspartame, we talked about Splenda. There's no real metabolic impact with aspartame and Splenda. So it's really hard to like get into the metabolomics, especially like even an untargeted metabolomic study. It's really hard to get into it with those compounds because there's no metabolic action. There's a possible toxicology action, like, but there's no metabolic action. Erythritol, there's a potential metabolic action. Xylitol, there's also a metabolic action. So you could infer, or you could also like basically invoke this entire thing to happen by saying like, okay, erythritol increases in the blood in unhealthy situations. So let's see if actually giving a dose of erythritol makes the body respond as if it's unhealthy, right? So that erythritol increases in unhealthy people. So if you consume erythritol, then you're gonna increase it and you're gonna become unhealthy or you're gonna simulate an unhealthy situation. It would simply be like saying, as simple as this, people with high blood sugar have diabetes. So sugar causes diabetes. So if you have sugar, you automatically have diabetes because you ate sugar. But that would actually be too kind. It's more like saying that person has diabetes 
and they have high blood sugar. So if you eat sugar and we draw your blood and we torture it a couple times and, you, and it's high sugar, you have diabetes. What if that's how a diagnosis worked, right? That would never fly, right? You see the actual problem. Now here's the other serious issue with this. That's a snapshot in time, one snapshot in time. So when you take a blood draw right after erythritol consumption and your erythritol levels go up, you don't even A, give them a chance to come back down. They didn't do this over different times. They did 30 minutes after consumption, not an additional 60 minute, 120, like most good studies do. They did one snapshot. So what if your body clears it really fast and it has no effect because it's cleared so fast? So you take one snapshot in time and expect that to be, say that's what the human body's gonna do? Like things are happening over the nanosecond in our body and there's feedback loops and there's signaling and there's flushing and there's the liver and there's a second pass through the liver and there's all these things and your erythrit erythritol is predominantly urinated out. So we have a serious issue there, not to mention it was a 20 participant study, which is not super, super small, but it's also not big and there were no unhealthy people being studied, only healthy people perhaps unhealthy people would respond entirely different, right? Now, so the big question is, does a temporary potential increase in platelet aggregation in a tortured cultured dish really mean anything? Especially if the alternative is sugary beverages where we know having consistently high levels of blood sugar would be problematic. So think about it like this. These were healthy people that consumed glucose or erythritol. A healthy person will respond just fine to glucose. If we took an unhealthy population and we gave them erythritol or glucose, perhaps the erythritol would be, a, even, even in this case, a safer option, right? Because an unhealthier person is going to respond to glucose entirely different and it could activate the pentose phosphate pathway and increase erythritol in the blood. It very well could because you're stoking something that's already unhealthy. So I proposed the question that maybe we needed to pump the brakes on erythritol. And I'm saying we need to do more research on this for sure, but we should be doing more research on everything all the time because we have the ability to and we should. But this group seems to have an increasing track record of doing this with erythritol and xylitol in the crosshairs consistently. And I think we need to factor that in. But if you take your blood and you put it in a Petri dish and you add chemicals to it, it's gonna do weird <laughs> It just is. And I think that's common sense. So I know that they are asking for a reevaluation for erythritol to be considered grass, generally recognized as safe. And that's fine. You know, maybe the due diligence needs to be done there. But for now, we need to take the data for what it's worth. And it's really, unfortunately, not much. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.